In the last video, we looked at sketching a project in the critical time with the least number of workers. In this video, we're going to look at sketching a project when we have fewer workers than the lower bound required to complete the project in the critical time. So let's see what that means. In the last example, we had 67 time periods. That now was the sum of all of the activities. We divided this by the critical time and it gave us approximately 2.16. This told me that the lower bound of workers required was three. We round up now to the next integer. So we couldn't complete the project in the critical time with less than three workers. Sometimes we'll be asked to complete the project with fewer workers than that lower bound. Clearly, this is going to have a knock-on effect to the project time and also the activity starting on time. So let's look at an example of this. We're asked to construct a scheduling diagram based on the activity network below, given that only two workers are available. We need to find the new minimum time for the completion of the project. So we've got two workers. Just out of interest, we could look now at the lower bound. So if we consider the lower bound and we're not asked to do it, we could go ahead and add these up. So this would give me now the number of workers or the minimum number of workers required such that this project finishes on time. So I'm just adding up the weights on the arcs, plus now the 4, plus the 7. Then we've got plus 6, five, uh, so plus 6, plus 3, plus 8. And then we've got now plus 4. So that gives me now 46. If we divide that by the critical time, the critical time is 20. And that's going to give us 2.3. So our lower bound is going to be 2.3. So we're going to round up to 3. So we would need at least three workers to complete this on time. What we're going to do is do it with two. So we're going to have worker one and we're going to have worker two. The difference between this and the last example is that we don't use a cascade or Gantt chart to draw now the scheduling chart. We use the activity network. That's because of the dependencies and we have to be very careful when we're allocating these activities to each worker as we must meet all of these dependencies. So let's go ahead and start. What we're going to do is play by the basic guidelines that we had before. That is, if one of the workers is ready to take an activity, we allocate it to them. If we have a choice of two, we give them the most critical. That is, that the late event time is the lower of the two values. So let's go ahead and start now with worker number one, and we can give them activity A. So activity A can start from the beginning, and I can write on here now that A will be allocated to worker number one. I'm just going to put a line under to just remind myself I've already done it. We can see B can be started straight away. So at the beginning, worker number two is ready to start. We allocate them activity B. So on here, we're just going to put B, and then we'll just strike that off to show now that I've added it. If we now consider worker number two has completed activity B and is ready to start the next activity. If we look now at the activity network, we can see that worker number two could start E. E depends on B only, so we can start now activity E, and that's going to have a time period now of four. If we look at the others, we can't start C now because C requires A to be complete. So I couldn't just start C here because we need A to be complete. So I'm going to allocate worker number two, E. So on here, we can put E. At this stage, worker number one has completed. Therefore, we need to allocate them a new activity. At this stage, I've got a choice, C or D. C and D both depend on the completion of A. So my choice is the one with the lowest value in the late event time, or if you like, the most critical. The most critical is C, so we're going to now allocate C. So if we just now write in here, this is going to be C, and we've given that to worker number one. At this stage, worker number one is ready for the next activity, and we consider just allocating at this point activity D. So let's go ahead and do activity D. I've chosen activity D as it's now got the lower late event time. So what I'm going to do is have activity D and we'll place that on like so. So activity D can go there. Activity D depends on only the completion of A. So on here we can put D and we will have that and we can write now that that is included. 
I can now see that worker number two is standing idle and ready for the next activity. Logic would say that we give them activity I. If we consider though now I has a late event time of 16, I'm going to allocate them activity F. I can allocate activity F as C has already been finished at this point right here and it has a lower now late event time. So what I'm going to do is allocate activity F now to worker number two and that has a time period of seven. So let's go ahead and put that on and we can now write on here F has been added and we'll write a little note there and then we've got F on there. So I've now added these all to my scheduling diagram. At this stage, worker number one is ready for the next activity. As we can see here, I can allocate G or I. I can't yet allocate H, despite all of these having the same late event time. H requires F to be completed before it starts. Therefore, I've got G or I. I can take a pick right here. I'm going to give them now G. So what I'm going to do is give them G. And as you can see at this stage now, this particular scheduling diagram is not unique. So what we're going to do is just allocate at this stage G. So G depends on only the completion of B and D as we can see from the activity network. So I can put that on. And there is my six time periods. So let's go ahead and do that. This is going to be G and I can strike this off. Now at this stage, I've got F. So F has now been completed and I've got uh, worker number two ready and waiting to take the next task. So I'm going to give them activity I. So let's go ahead and do activity I. So activity I has got a time period now of eight. And as you can see, by adding this on now, I'm going to have gone past the original critical time for the project. So we can see that we've already bust that time. And that's going to be I. So what we've got here is I. Now I can see from here that I could now allocate worker number one H. H depends on the completion of F only. Therefore, I can now allocate H to worker number one. So let's go ahead and do that. That's going to be three time periods and we are going to be just here. So let's do that. H depends on F and F only. So there's H, we'll put it on just here. Okay, this now leaves me with one activity left. We've got J. We need to be very careful here in terms of who we assign this to and essentially at what time. If we look, J depends on I being completed. An error would be to just simply say, well, H has been done, so we can now allocate J. We can't as we need I to be complete. Therefore, I need to wait for this activity to be finished. Therefore, I'm now going to give activity J to worker number two. So you can see by adding the four, that's taken me to 26 time periods instead of 24. So this is now going to be J. We can put this on and that is now done. So we're at this stage now and we can say that that will be 26 time periods. So find the new minimum time for the completion of the project. Instead of 20, we've gone out to 26. And do be very careful right here, not allocating J to worker one because they've completed H as we need I to also be completed. And that is the benefit of using the activity network when you're doing a scheduling diagram. So there we go, there's a basic example. In future videos, we will look at a range of different questions on scheduling, but hopefully that's given you a good starting point.